your life. Welcome to our third Summer Science on the Screen program. Remember, these programs will happen every Wednesday at 10 a.m. on the YouTube channel you're watching right now up until August 5th. Um, also, keep in mind that that little chat box on the side, you can write in questions at any time, and we'll be able to see those and answer them live as we go through this program. One last little piece of um, housekeeping is you're going to need some paper and some art utensils, uh, colored pencils, markers, things like that. For later on, we're going to draw a fish, and we'd like for you to draw a fish along with us. So on that note, today we are going to focus again on the amazing aquatic world that surrounds us on the Outer Banks, and we are going to investigate fish biology. We will, throughout the program, learn about fish adaptations, create our own fish like Dave was just talking about, and then we'll even learn about the ways that fish protect themselves in their environments. So to, to get us started and kind of in the mood to talk about fish, we're going to watch a short video that's shot right off the coast of North Carolina here, um, and it will show us the underwater world. So keep in mind this is right off the coast, even with all those beautiful corals and colors. Um, and since we're focused on fish today, really take a look at the different fish that you're seeing on the screen and kind of what their behavior is. Um, and so part of today's focus isn't just going to be on identifying species of fish, but kind of looking at how their anatomy is set up or how, what kind of adaptations they have and the environments that they live in. So in this video, besides the fish, you're also seeing um, some sea turtles and some other aquatic life, but we still want to keep in mind how fish interact with those things as well. And so the, the depth of this video changes throughout the video, but some of these depths are 100 to 130 feet deep, so pretty deep, and we may see different fish that live in those environments. And some of the more colorful pictures are from um, shallower environments, and we will see different fish that will live in those areas as well. So hopefully you're noticing in the video too that fish aren't solitary, meaning they don't always live alone. Um, and so there's schools of fish, and we're going to talk about how they actually school a little later. So how do all those fish kind of stay in line and not bump all into each other? Um, and we're also seeing some of our larger fish like sharks that frequent the coast here. And so the sand tiger shark is actually a species of shark that North Carolina is really well known for. Um, and there's many sand tiger sharks that live right off the coast. All right, so these were all shipwrecks right here in North Carolina. Hopefully you've seen the differences in all the fish, where they're living, what they're doing. Big congregations. All right, so now that we kind of have a feeling, we would love to take you snorkeling or diving, but that's just not going to happen today. So that was kind of our way to, to get us into that mode. Um, we want to then focus specifically on adaptations that we see within fish. And so we're going to look at some pictures of fish. I'm going to tell you um, their common name. And so the common name for the fish, um, there can be more than one. And so it can be a little confusing. And Parker is going to explain to us in just a little while how we classify fish and the way that we do that. But I'm going to use just their common names, not their scientific names, as we go through it. That's good. And in the video, we also saw that fish can look a lot of different ways. How many different species of fish are there, Dave? Um, there's over 28,000 different species of fish. So many different fish. We're not going to cover all of them today. Um, luckily, we're just going to cover a few of them. But we do want to focus on some of the very unique adaptations. Um, so this first fish that you see, this is called a sea robin. Um, look at kind of where it's spending its time, how the fins are set up. It has very unique fins. Um, we're going to actually build our own fish later. And you may want it to have some of the features that this sea robin has, depending on um, where we want it to live and what we want it to eat. We also have a flounder. Um, flounders are very unique, a lot different than the sea robin. Um, they also spend time on the bottom. And we're going to kind of use this one as our example of an ambush predator. It's one that has a really big mouth and uses camouflage to blend into its environment. We have a striped burfish. Um, so obviously, it has some adaptations to protect itself. And we're going to talk about some other species of fish that also use adaptations to live in their environment and protect themselves from predators. We have a mackerel. 
very different shape than some of the other fish. Um, we'll talk specifically about why its anatomy is this way and, and what that tells us about where it lives and what it eats. We have a cobia, interesting coloration. We will spend some time talking about colors um, and what that can tell us about where things live. This is a black drum. Um, it's got those barbels on its chin, very unique. The coloration, the way that it's shaped, um, it can, can really give us some clues into what it eats and where it spends its time. This is an eel, an American eel. Um, we're going to talk about what makes it a fish, what is something that all these fish have. Um, and the eel is a good one to keep in mind when you ask that question. You know, what does the eel not have that a lot of other fish do, and how can we define that? We have a croaker, a bull shark, um, pretty different looking than some of the other fish we've seen so far. We are going to talk a little bit about sharks, one of my favorite subjects. We'll just dabble in sharks a little bit, just enough to make sure we understand the difference between them and other types of fish. We have a spotted sea trout, a red drum, and a cow nose ray. And so a lot of these are animals that we'd find in our estuary system. We also find them in the ocean, but they do spend time in the estuary system. And we're going to move kind of to animals now that we might find more um, in open ocean or even in this particular case, the lamprey has found some of its life in rivers. And so we have fish that don't just live in one environment, they can move through different environments, freshwater, brackish water, and salt water. The marlin, um, think about coloration on this one, really it's got some very unique characteristics. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. We have a great white shark, a lionfish, also very unique characteristics. Um, it's got a very good story and there's some research that's been done on them locally and we'll cover that. This is the sand tiger shark we saw some video of earlier. An angler fish. Um, obviously it doesn't look like a lot of the other fish we've seen. This is a deep water species. Has special adaptations to live in that environment. A thresher shark. Same thing. Obvious adaptations. Obvious um, differences compared to other sharks. And we'll talk about how it benefits the shark to have those. And that's going to take us to how we actually classify all these different fish. Great. So as you guys just saw on the screen for a moment, we have that pyramid there. Um, at the bottom, the pyramid is most broad, and that's what we would think about as the kingdom or domain. That's the beginning of what we would call animal classifications or taxonomy. Beyond kingdom, you have phylum and class, and it goes up higher and higher to become more specific until you get down to species. So before we get started talking about fish, I'll talk about uh, wanchis, where CSI is located, and use that as the example. So for our domain, we have outer space. For the kingdom, we have the Milky Way. For phylum, we have our planet Earth. And from there, it starts to get more specific so that it narrows down to our location. It's, we're in the Northern Hemisphere, in the United States. Our family would be considered North Carolina. Our genus would be Dare County. And finally, our species, or in this case, the town, would be Wanchis. So what we can think about that is then taking that in terms of fish. So I will display on the screen the full taxonomy of the sand mullet. Now, Dave mentioned a little bit earlier that a lot of times we call species by their common name, but he also mentioned that those could vary from region to region, even though we're talking about the same fish. So in the scientific world, we use what we call the scientific name, which are those last two Latin words down at the bottom of the screen. Its scientific name would be Mughal cephalus, and that means corresponds to sand mullet. Interesting. Why do we use Latin? It helps us to be or helps us to be less confused. Um, with different languages all around the world. It helps us to decrease that language barrier when talking about the same animals. Excellent. All right, so now that we know how to classify animals, um, we want to focus back on fish. And with our fish, you saw a bunch of different species of fish. Um, we want to come up with a really basic definition. And so what's three things that all fish have? 
And we saw there's all those adaptations. There's lots of different sizes and colors and fins. And, but what's three things that all fish have? Parker, can you think of one thing that all fish have? Hmm. A backbone? Good. So all fish are definitely going to have a backbone. Um, that, that is part of their taxonomy. They're in the chordata um, grouping. So that means they all are going to have a backbone. What's another thing you think all fish could have? some sort of fin maybe good so and through all the pictures they have all different shapes fin, but even our eel has one fin um, so all fish are going to have at least one fin and then the last one hopefully is fairly obvious they're going to spend at least most of their time in the water there are some examples of fish that can come all the way out of the water there's fish that can gulp air um, but they're all going to spend at least most of their time in the water so that's going to be our basic definition of a fish it has a backbone it has at least one fin and it's going to spend at least part of its time or majority of its time in the water but now we're going to focus in on three classes of fish. We're going to tell you some details about those three classes of fish, um, and then we'll get right to making our own fish. So the first class we want to talk about is called Agnatha. Um, and Agnatha is the jawless fish. We don't see them very frequently here, um, and so we'll just kind of talk about them briefly. It's the lamprey and the hagfish. The lamprey and the hagfish do not have jaws. They have rasping tongues, so they have tongues that are really rough that they can use to kind of um, lick through things and, and use that to be able to get into their prey items. Looking at the hagfish, right, it's not a particularly fast looking fish. It doesn't really have complex eyes. Um, it only has eye spots. And so this fish is actually going to eat dead things. That's going to be what it eats. And so when things die and sink to the bottom of the ocean, the hagfish is one of the things that will help them decompose. Um, what's really unique about the hagfish is that it makes a slime. Um, and so if we had a hagfish up here today, we don't, but if we did, we could touch it and move it around, and if it gets irritated at all, um, it'll secrete a protein that makes a slime, and it can fill up an entire five-gallon bucket with slime, um, and that slime has actually been studied by the Navy to see if they could use it for ways to defend against um, boats and ships coming into areas. And so it makes its own slime, a slime that could be used um, by people for other reasons. Um, like I said, it, it lives deep, and one of the ways that it eats is it's going to actually tie itself into a knot to get... Um, a little bit of leverage and it can pull pieces of its decaying prey off and be able to eat them that way because they don't have jaws so they can't really take giant bites. They're just going to be able to hold on to things and pull them off. The lamprey, um, what's really interesting about the lamprey and something I wanted to point out is that they're anadromous, which means they're born in freshwater and then they're going to move into the ocean um, for part of their life and then they actually come back into freshwater when they spawn. And so. Um, the lamprey during its time in the ocean is a parasite, um, but when it's in freshwater, it's going to kind of live a different life and eat different prey. The next class we're going to talk about is called chondrichthys or cartilaginous fish. Um, and so these have a skeleton that are made up of the same things that the tip of our nose and our ear lobes are made of, cartilage. Um, and so these are our sharks, skates, rays, and chimera. There's about 800 different species um, in the cartilaginous group. Very interesting fish. Um, that picture that you see is a chimera. It kind of looks like a bunch of fish. It might look like the fish we draw today, actually. A bunch of fish that kind of been put together. Um, it's a deep water fish. But our skates and rays and sharks, it's many different kinds. But on average, a shark is, um, the average shark is three to four feet. So when we think of sharks, I think a lot of us think of giant sharks. But a lot of the sharks that we would see out there are pretty small. And they have specialized um, senses that we're going we're gonna to get into. But let's start with rays. So when we look at rays here, rays are a flat bottom fish, meaning they live on the bottom. Um, and they have these special things called spiracles. And so if you guys can see right there, that hole right behind the eye, that's called a spiracle. And because the gills for the ray, so if you look at this picture over here, the gills from the ray are on the bottom of the ray, and that's the part that's on the sand, or in the sand um, it would be hard for the ray to get fresh water over top of those gills. So the spiracle works like a snorkel. It allows the ray to pull water down and over top of the gills. Rays have a couple different ways to protect themselves. Um, they have a stinger or a barb. That's what we have in this bottom picture. So if you were to accidentally step on a ray, um, it could sting you with a barb to protect itself. Um, that's why they've created the stingray shuffle. It's a little dance move that you can do to avoid stepping on the rays. But the rays also, some of them, have the ability to give electric shock. Um, and so they have unique adaptations to protect themselves in their environment. Any idea what a ray would eat? Because we saw some shark jaws that were a lot of teeth. Do you think rays have lots of teeth? 
I think they're smaller teeth. Smaller but teeth? they might have some. Yeah, and kind of crushing plates. Um, so they're going to find things in the sand like clams and mollusks to eat, and they're going to crush them up using those crushing plates. Makes sense since their mouth is on the bottom, right? Exactly. Figuring stuff out. <coughs> Excuse me. Next, we'll move into sharks. Um, so sharks, lots of different species of sharks live in many different environments. Um, we added a picture of a goblin shark here in the bottom left. That's a deep water species. As far as we know, we don't really know why it has that interesting beak on the front there, um, but it's an adaptation that must help it live in its environment. Um, but sharks have a couple adaptations that help them survive. Um, the picture on the top right is a picture of what we call a nictitating membrane. So because sharks eat larger prey items, things like seals and sea lions, things that might have claws and teeth, um, when the shark goes in to take its bite, it's actually going to roll that nictitating membrane up over top of its eye to protect its eye so that it wouldn't lose the eye when it was trying to get its lunch. Um, they also have a specialized sense that allow them pick up, to pick up electrical current in the water. And that's called the ampullae of Lorenzini. Um, and the hammerhead is set up to really utilize that because it has such a large head. It has a lot of ampullae of Lorenzini across the front. And that helps it pick up things that are underwater in the sand. Um, and so as it's, oops, as it's going through the sand, or over top of the sand, it can pick up things that are living in the sand and burrow in and eat them. Many different species of shark, they can have, um, a lot of them have kind of a conveyor belt of teeth, um, and so they can rotate through their teeth, uh, go up to 30,000 of them in a lifetime, um, and so they'll lose a tooth, and then a new one will come in and takes it, take its place right away. So sharks actually have seven senses, as opposed to our five senses that we have. They have two additional senses that help them really um, thrive in their environments. And sharks can be found in freshwater, brackish water, and salt water. So they can be found in all those different environments. And then lastly, we want to talk about our bony fish, or our Osti ichthys. Um, so this is our largest group of fish. It's hard to talk about because we're talking about 25,000 different species at one time. Um, but just a couple interesting little facts to start us. The largest bony fish is the bluefin tuna, but the heaviest bony fish is the mola mola. And that's what we have a picture of here. That's actually me in that picture swimming with the mola mola right off the coast here. It was only about seven or eight miles out. Um, and mola molas frequent our coastline. They're very big. They get very heavy. Any ideas what you think they eat? They eat jellyfish, primarily jellyfish. Really? Mm -hmm. Even to be that big? Even to be that big. That's yeah. crazy. Remember that plankton lesson we did last that's week? That's true. Yep. So to, to really um, talk about our bony fish, what we're going to do is we're going to draw one piece by piece and talk about each piece and adaptation and how that benefits the fish. And we are encouraging you to do that as well. So we want you at home, as we go through each piece, to make it um, on your own paper. No, none of our fish will look the same, and I guarantee the fish that we draw isn't going to be any of the fish we've seen today. It's going to be a combination of Frankenstein of all the different parts. So let's get started. What is the first thing that our fish should have? Probably a body. Very good. Will you draw us a body, please? Sure. Okay, good. So we have kind of a rounded body. Um, the body shape of the fish can tell us kind of what it does and how it moves. And so if we go back to our pictures of fish, we have a few here. Many different body shapes in these pictures of fish. And that's going to kind of tell us a little bit about where they live and, and what they do, how quickly they move. And so we have kind of some skinnier shapes. We call those fusiform shapes. They may be predators and fast-moving fish. And then we have some rounder shapes, kind of like what Parker drew. They may leave, live in reef environments um, and not have to move as quickly or move as much. So when we think about tunas and mackerels and things that spend all their time swimming in the water, they're going to be a little more what we call hydrodynamic. Could, do you think you could draw more of a fusiform shape too? Sure. Parker does all our drawing because I'm not a skilled artist. Good. So we have our two basic shapes, kind of a rounder shape and more of a football looking shape, which we're going to call a fusiform shape. Okay, what's something else our fish might need? Some means to swim. Some means to swim. Good. And so our fish is going to have many different fins. Um, the first fin, let's start with the dorsal fin. So the dorsal fin is the fin that's on top. And in most cases, the dorsal fin is going to be able to keep the fish in a straight line, kind of like the keel of a sailboat. 
Um, but it also can be used for propulsion in some species of fish, like the trigger fish actually uses its dorsal fin to be able to move through the water. Um, but normally it's to keep it kind of in a straight line, keep it from spiraling. We also have an anal fin, which is kind of the opposite side of a dorsal fin, but does much of the same thing. Um, and then that trigger fish that we were talking about, it's going to also move to give it some propulsion. We have some pectoral fins. Those are the pelvic fins. The, the pelvic fins are on the underside of the fish. Um, and so if we look at our species of fish that we have, oops, this way. Some of our fish live flat on the bottom, like our drum, and they spend time on the, the bottom. And so the pelvic fins underneath um, are actually going to be able to sit on the sand in some cases. Um, and like our sea robin that we started with, it has very unique pelvic fins and actually can kind of use the pelvic fins to almost walk across the bottom. Um, and so they, they can be specialized depending on where the fish lives and what it does. And then we have our pectoral fins that are going to be used mainly for steering. Um, and our bigger, larger, faster species of fish will stick those pectoral fins out when they need to steer. And then when they're moving quickly in one direction, they'll put them down at the side so they're more hydrodynamic. And then we're going to have a caudal fin or a tail fin. Good. And so with our caudal fins, there's a couple different types. Um, this is what I would consider to be a paddle fin. Um, and so our paddle fin can move lots of water and is pretty maneuverable, um, but it's not really built for fast speed or for swimming for long periods of time. Um, we also have more of a forked tail that we see in some of our more pelagic species. Pelagic means open ocean. So more, more of our pelagic species that are going to swim their whole lives um, out in the middle of the water column. And so they need to be a little more hydrodynamic. And like with our mackerel there, that's what we see is more of a paddle or more of a fork tail, not so much a paddle tail that we'll see in some of our other species of fish, um, like our sea robin and some of the other ones. Sure. OK, so that's our fins. There's one more, right? <gasps> there is? There sure. Oh yeah, so the, you're right, for our caudal fin, we also have some specialized fish that have very unique ones. Um, and one we wanted to talk about was this thresher shark. So that thresher shark has such a large top lobe of its caudal fin and a very small bottom lobe of its caudal fin. Caudal fin. And the top lobe um, can actually be used to whip around and kind of knock fish unconscious so that it can eat them easier. Um, and so this thresher shark has a very, very large one. We call that heterogeneous. So it's not the same. Homogeneous would be the same top and bottom. Heterogeneous means the top is different than the bottom. Um, and that's what we see with our thresher shark. Sweet. Speaking of sharks, we actually have a question. Yes. Um, Stephanie wants to know what species of shark is the most common or has the highest number in the world? In the whole world? That's what she said. Holy moly. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I would say locally, um, I can't speak for the whole world, but locally what we see a lot of are sandbar sharks, sand tiger sharks, and then um, a few of the smaller species of dogfish, things like that. That's what we see off the beach commonly. Um, but I don't know about the whole world. We'll, we'll have to have get to back to you, that. Stephanie. Yeah. Good question. So now that we're done with our fins, what's something else that our fish might need? The ability to breathe underwater. Okay, good. And so it's going to need some gills. So the gills are the way that the fish can breathe. Go ahead, draw any type of gill you would like. So depending on the fish, they can be different things. When we look at sharks, they have gill slits. Um, they have between five and seven gill slits down the side. And so that's how the water is going to enter their body so that the gills can actually take the oxygen out of the water and utilize it. And a lot of our bony fish we're going to have something called an operculum, which is a, a cover that covers up the gills. So you don't actually see the gills when you look at the fish. So when we look at any of our bony fish, like the red drum here, you don't actually see the gills up near the head. You see the bony covering, and the gills are underneath. And then with some of our other species of fish, they're just going to have openings or pores, like our lamp right here, where there's just a way for the water to get in. So there's a couple of different ways um, that the fish can get water into their body to go over top of their gills to be able to get the oxygen out. Great. All right, what about a mouth? Needs that too. It's got to De eat. Definitely needs a mouth. 
So there's three different types of mouths. Um, there's a mouth that points downward. Well, the lionfish is an example of a really large mouth. So before we talk about the three types, we should talk about fish generally don't take bites. Um, there are some exceptions, but normally a fish has to be able to eat its prey whole. And so a fish like the lionfish has a gigantic mouth, so it can eat prey items that are nearly the size of its own body, um, so it can eat lots of different sizes of prey, and it can eat pretty large prey. Some other fish, depending on what they eat, are going to have different size mouths. Um, but in general, there's three types. There's a mouth that faces down, um, which is called an inferior mouth. And our drum is an example of an inferior mouth, or our croaker. Our croaker here has a mouth that faces down. And so that so we go. type of mouth is going to really eat things underneath the fish. Right? It's not going to be particularly good at coming up underneath things um, or catching things from the side. It's going to be kind of looking on the bottom and eating things underneath it. Then there's a superior mouth where the mouth is on top. Um, I'm not even going to try to draw that today. <laughs> but the superior mouth is the anglerfish is an example, example of a superior mouth. So let's get to the anglerfish. The mouth points in the upwards direction. The anglerfish is very unique. It has another adaptation in that it has a lure basically that's on top of its head. It has the ability to create its own living light called bioluminescence. And so it can move that lure back and forth, kind of trick fish to come in close, and then it can use that gigantic upward facing mouth to come up from underneath and eat, eat them. Wow. And then we have a terminal mouth, which is what we see with our mackerel and marlin and things like that, where it points straight to the side and they're actually going to chase their prey down, um, which makes sense. And so it's pointed forward so that it can go ahead and chase the prey down and eat them like that. So that's our mouse. Great. Um, we aren't going to talk about teeth. There's lots of different types of teeth and the <laughs> way that they fit, but they're just going to be inside the mouth in our drawing. What's something else we might need? The lateral line. Oh, the lateral line. Good one. So the lateral line is a, a line of gel-filled sacs that run along the side of the fish, um, and they give the fish the ability to feel vibrations in the water. And so if you have ever stuck your hand in a fish tank when the fish couldn't see you or tried to catch a fish when you were behind it and they still got away, that's why. It's because they can feel the vibration in the water even if they can't see you and they can move away. That's also how fish know where other fish are in relation to them. So if you're in a school, um, there's not a fish that's giving directions necessarily, but all those fish can feel each other through the vibrations created in the water using the lateral line. Great. I think, think we need an eye. Yeah, probably needs to see. So not all fish have real eyes or complex eyes. Some have very basic eyes. There's also like the blind cave fish that doesn't have any type of eye. Um, but the eyes are going to tell us a little bit about where the fish lives and what it eats as well. So a large eye might tell us that the fish lives somewhere deep where it has to be able to collect lots of light. It may also tell us it's a predator, so it needs to be able to see its prey. So it has to have a complex eye to do that um, and a larger eye. A small eye might tell us that the fish lives so deep, there's no light down there at all, so it doesn't actually use any energy to create an eye because it wouldn't be able to see. Um, it may also tell us that it's a prey and doesn't need to really, you know, if it uses its sense of smell to find decaying things, it doesn't really need to have a very, um, a lot of energy going towards its eye. Hmm. Are we missing anything else? No. Well, let's talk about some unique adaptations like coloration. Um, and so when we talk about coloration, depending on where the fish lives, we can tell, well, the coloration will tell us a lot about it. So if we look at the marlin, right, the marlin is dark on top, and then it's pretty um, light colored underneath, and then actually has lines along its side as well. So if you're looking at the marlin from the top, the bottom, or the side, it would blend into the water column and be pretty hard to see. Um, our sharks also use a similar coloration called counter shading where they're dark on top. So if you were in a boat trying to look down into the water and see the shark, it'd be difficult to do because it would blend in. And if you're underneath the shark looking up, it's white colored, so it blends in with the sun coming through the surface of the water. So it's camouflaged in two different directions. When we think of things like our cobia that we saw earlier, or any of these estuary fish, notice the color is kind of a little bit darker. When you're in the sound, the water in the sound usually is a little bit darker than the water in the ocean. Um, so it helps them blend in a little bit better for the environment they live in. And so like the cobia here, 
often found in estuary environments or right outside of inlets with darker water, has a dark top and a light bottom. Same idea, it blends in with its environment. Very colorful fish, um, like we saw in the video, live usually in colorful environments with lots of reefs and corals and things like that. Cool. Anything else? Well, I can give us an activity to do Ooh. that talks about coloration as well. Yeah, that's, before we do that, though, let's talk about one other way to protect themselves. So we saw the lionfish. Venomous spines, some shark, mm. some not shark, some fish have the ability to protect themselves through spines. And so the lionfish actually has venomous spines. You can be really careful if you're ever around a lionfish. Has the ability to poke, um, and with those spines, it can release venom into your body. That would really hurt. And that's how it protects itself from other fish. Um, fish don't really have a good way to get around those spines to eat the lionfish, so those spines kind of keep it protected. There's also a couple of species of sharks that do that. There's a puffer fish that will expand its body and blow up to appear bigger um, so that things can't eat it. And actually the schooling fish that we talked about earlier, all the small fish that all work together, they also, that's a defense mechanism to try to appear larger um, to keep prey, predators from coming to eat them. Huh. So a couple ways that fish try to protect themselves um, from being eaten. Sure. But camouflage is one that we see most often. I think that's where we were going. Yeah. So I can start you guys with an activity in just a second that you'll be able to spend more time on at home. I'll give you just a brief explanation. But I see that we have one more question. Oh, we do. This one comes from Emma, a four-year-old, and uh -oh. she wants to know why fish are so smelly. So smelly. We didn't talk about that. Good question, Emma. Um, so fish have a mucous membrane on the outside of their body that protects them. Um, and so that's when you pick them up and they're very slimy or smelly. It's because they have a mucus that is actually keeping um, things in the water from coming into their body and potentially hurting them. And so that's why when you touch fish, if you're going to just release them again, you want to make sure your hands are wet so you don't mess up that mucus membrane um, so that you can release them and they, they won't be injured. Thank you, cool. Emma. Good question. We actually have another question, too. Okay. Um, this says, Mr. Dave, I'm Benji. What do sharks eat besides sea turtles? Ooh, good question, Benji. Um, depending on the species of shark, and we can tell a lot by looking at the teeth of the shark. So there's sharks, like great white sharks, that eat larger marine mammals, um, and they'll eat dead whales or sea lions and seals and things like that. There's also fish eating sharks. And even within a species, like if we take great white sharks, there's some great whites that eat seals and sea lions. And then for a part of their life, they will eat fish and they'll be fish eaters. So they can change their diet based on um, where they are and what's available to them. But there's a lot of sharks, like the ones we would see locally that are gonna eat mainly fish or invertebrates, um, not really large items, but just kind of smaller fish. Cool. Thanks, Benji. All right. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions at this minute, but we will keep watching. In the meantime, I'll let you guys know about our camouflage activity. What you're gonna need at home is two plain pieces of white paper. It doesn't matter what size they are. And with one of those sheets, you are going to decorate the background. So it's gonna look like this. This is one that I did at home. I had colored pencils, a red marker, and some tissue paper. But you guys can use paint, crayons, um, construction paper, anything that you want to make this look like some sort of habitat. Since mine is bright colored, I would guess that my fish is probably going to live on a coral reef if it's aiming to blend in. So with that second piece of paper, you're going to cut out your fish shape. Mine is very simple, um, but since you guys have gotten the lowdown about how fish have adaptations, feel free to include any of those in your fish cutout as well. So a dorsal fin, maybe a mouth, um, you could color in an eye later on. But so that's the next part is decorating your fish. So I've had mine similar to its background. It's also brightly colored with some markered spots and it has one piece of tissue paper on it as well. And once you're done decorating both very similarly, you can put your fish onto your piece of paper and see how it blends into its environment. And that's how the fish is going to stay protected by using that camouflage to see or to make sure that it's hidden well in its place so that it, uh, it can avoid predators. And there's also fish like the flounder we talked about that use camouflage to hide from its prey so that um, it can ambush them and surprise them and eat them without the prey knowing that they're there. That's right. Excellent. 
Um, so you guys have fun with that. We do want to mention some research that's going on before we sign off. And so um, there is a series or a few different projects that CSI is involved with in different ways. Um, one is the lionfish project that the North Carolina Aquarium System is leading. And they're really interested in understanding how many lionfish are out on our local wrecks, how quickly they repopulate those wrecks, what they've been eating, the different sexes. And so we go out and help them collect lionfish. Um, there's a spot a shark program. If anyone that's watching this is going to be near sharks and you want to take a picture of the side of the shark, you can send it in. It's a citizen-based project. Um, and they're going to make a database, or they are making a database, of all the sharks that are seen by divers or snorkelers. And they're trying to better understand the population of sand tiger sharks that's out there and how they move around during different times of the year. Um, so if you have a camera in your hands and you see a shark, take a picture of the side of it, and you can send it in. And then your picture will be used as part of the data. Um, there's also some projects going on with different organizations that are looking at habitats and how fish utilize different spaces, how they use shipwrecks, how they use different reefs. There's fish counts that are going on. Um, and so actually people that are really good at identifying fish underwater and they will count while they're diving the different species of fish and how many of each one. That's a very unique skill set. Um, and then they bring that information up and we'll have a better understanding of what's using those environments. And then there's also projects that ECU's involved with that are looking at toxins that move through the food web um, and understanding where those toxins come from and why there's outbreaks of those toxins that can actually be harmful for people that eat the fish that have the toxin. Um, and that toxin is called ciguatera. So lots of different projects that relate to fish, fisheries biology, and understanding how fish use our environment. So I've got a couple quick plugs. Uh -huh. um, with Spotted Shark, they actually use photo ID as part of their work. And that's something that we will talk about next week with marine mammals. So if you guys want to tune in for that, you can. Um, and we also had another question, is a jellyfish really a fish? Ooh. And that's actually something we covered last week. So if you missed it, you can go back um, to our YouTube channel and check out the Plankton um, live stream, and you will be able to find out the answer to that. Well, we're going to make them wait. Well, what's the big difference between jellyfish and fish? Well, fish are able to control where they go and swim against the current, whereas a jellyfish isn't really able to do that as much, if at all. And yeah, and the jellyfish is an invertebrate, which means it doesn't have a backbone, and a fish does have a backbone. So really calling it a jellyfish is kind of inaccurate. You should call it a jelly because it's an invertebrate. It doesn't have a backbone, and therefore it can't be a fish. Awesome. All right, so next week, marine mammals. Yep. Um, please tune in. Thank you guys for all your questions this week. I hope you had a good time, and we'll see you next week. See ya.